Welcome to the Culture of Healthcare, Evidence-Based Practice. This is Lecture F. The component, The Culture of Healthcare, addresses job expectations in healthcare settings. It discusses how care is organized within a practice setting, privacy laws, and professional and ethical issues encountered in the workplace. By the end of this unit, Evidence-Based Practice, students will be able to define the key tenets of Evidence-Based Medicine, or EBM, and its role in the culture of healthcare. Construct answerable clinical questions and critically appraise evidence answering them. Explain how EBM can be applied to intervention studies, including the phrasing of answerable questions, finding evidence to answer them, and applying them to given clinical situations. Describe how EBM can be applied to key clinical questions of diagnosis, harm, and prognosis. Discuss the benefits and limitations to summarizing evidence. Describe how EBM is used in clinical settings through clinical practice guidelines and decision analysis. This lecture discusses summarizing evidence. The idea behind summarizing evidence is that for many tests and treatments, there are multiple studies, such that one study doesn't tell the whole story. One study may contradict others, or studies may complement each other, and taken together, make a much stronger case. For this reason, there's a growing trend toward what are called systematic reviews or evidence reports that aim to bring all the evidence on a given test or treatment together. Remember the Haynes 4S model? It has studies at its foundation, then syntheses and synopses that bring the data together and make it available to users, particularly clinicians, in a highly digested form. Summarizing the evidence doesn't mean simply collecting a few studies and combining their findings. There are methodologic changes in summarizing the evidence. Such challenges were recently elucidated in a supplement to the journal Annals of Internal Medicine, emphasizing that methodology is required to do summarizations of evidence. If we're going to create a systematic review, what are the steps? Guyot, in a textbook on evidence-based medicine, describes the steps in creating a systematic review. First, we have to define the clinical question as it pertains to the population, intervention, comparison where appropriate, and outcome. We then conduct a literature search. We have to define the information sources we're going to use and come up with a search strategy. In a systematic review, a literature search isn't done just by typing a few terms into Medline. We have to conduct a comprehensive search of the literature and cast a broad net to ensure that we retrieve a sufficient number of articles to evaluate. We can then appropriately include what usually turns out to be a relatively small number of articles. Once we have a large number of related articles, we establish inclusion and exclusion criteria for the articles that we'll ultimately use in our review. Most steps in the process have measures of reproducibility, so typically, the Medline records, with their titles and abstracts, as well as the full-text articles that we choose to analyze further, are selected in more than one copy to determine whether different individuals evaluating the same article have reached the same judgment. Once we identify the articles that we're going to use in the systematic review, we abstract the data from them and then conduct the analysis. For example, if we're going to perform a meta-analysis, we determine the method of pooling and explore the heterogeneity of the results. So we explore whether some results point in one direction of a treatment and other results point in a different direction. We also assess for publication and other types of bias. What kind of analysis do we perform in a systematic review? Systematic reviews often use meta-analysis, where the results of multiple studies that are appropriately similar are combined. If we have multiple studies that have looked at, for example, the use of a treatment in a disease with a certain patient population, it's appropriate to combine these studies in a meta-analysis, which gives us more statistical power. When we have a larger sample size, it's easier to achieve statistical significance, and we're pooling data from different studies but from studies that are similar. We don't have to do a meta-analysis in a systematic review. In fact, if the studies are too heterogeneous because there are different patient characteristics, different settings, or other factors, it would be inappropriate to combine them in a meta-analysis. In systematic reviews, looking at telemedicine, for example, it's difficult to do a meta-analysis when one telemedicine study is a dermatology study, 
another one is a radiology study, and yet another is a psychiatry study. When systematically reviewing the evidence for improved patient outcomes or improved ability to do diagnosis using any kind of telemedicine, it would be inappropriate to combine all the studies. It would perhaps be possible to combine a few studies in some areas, but in the case of telemedicine, these studies are quite heterogeneous. When we do a meta-analysis, we use a summary measure that gives us an indication of the treatment effect. We use either the odds ratio or the weighted mean difference, which we explain in the next slide. In discussing the meaning of summary statistics, the odds ratio is used for binary events. Many studies are reported in terms of how they reduce certain events that we're trying to avoid, such as death, complications of a disease, the development of a myocardial infarction, high blood pressure, kidney disease, diabetes, the recurrence of a disease, or the re-emergence of cancer after initial treatment. Usually, the odds ratio statistic is configured when it's less than one, which indicates there's a benefit for treatment. This is the approach, for example, that the Cochrane collaboration uses, which we talk about later in this lecture. When the odds ratio is less than one, then there's benefit for the treatment, and it turns out that when the confidence interval does not include the odds ratio equals one line, when it does not cross over that line, our results are statistically significant. We can actually calculate in a somewhat complicated formula the number needed to treat from the odds ratios so we can translate odds ratio findings into more meaningful information from a practical standpoint. The other summary statistic is weighted mean difference. This statistic is used for numeric events such as measurements, for example, blood pressure value or blood sugar value. The weighted mean difference is usually configured such that a value less than zero indicates that there's a treatment benefit, and a value of greater than zero indicates that there's benefit for the control intervention just as an odds ratio value of greater than 1 indicates that the control is of more benefit. Again, if the confidence interval crosses over the weighted mean difference equals 0 line, or if it does not cross over that line, it means that the results are statistically significant. Let's look at some examples of systematic reviews, in particular, systematic reviews of the treatment of cardiac risk factors. A group of meta-analyses published in the early part of the last decade found benefits for lowering cholesterol, or homocysteine levels, either with statin drugs or with other types of drugs or with other interventions, such as diet. The combined publication of these meta-analyses led to a proposal for developing a so-called polypill that would contain six medications, a statin, three blood pressure-lowering drugs in half their standard dose, a beta blocker, folic acid, and aspirin. The authors argued that such a pill could potentially reduce cardiovascular disease in Western countries by 80%. There was disagreement that giving everyone this pill would have this beneficial an outcome. Many argued that the polypill would need to be subjected to a randomized controlled trial. There was much correspondence in the British Medical Journal and elsewhere about the polypill. A different suggestion was the notion of a poly meal that would be natural and safe as well as tasty and would give people appropriate portions of wine, fish, dark chocolate, fruits and vegetables, garlic and almonds. The poly pill has actually been developed and is undergoing initial clinical trials in India. The initial trial was in 2009 and showed favorable results at the time. A subsequent study in 2012 has shown that this pill does lower blood pressure and cholesterol beneficially. The Cochrane Collaboration is an important international initiative with the aim of preparing and maintaining systematic reviews of the effects of healthcare interventions. The main focus of the Cochrane Collaboration is on interventions, not diagnosis or harm unless the harm takes place in the context of an intervention or prognosis. There is information, including the abstracts of all the reviews that the Cochrane Collaboration has produced, on its website at www.cochrane.org. The main product of the Cochrane Collaboration is the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews. The Cochrane Collaboration and the database get their names from a British physician, Archie Cochrane, who stated in 1972 that it's surely a great criticism of our profession 
that we've not organized a critical summary by specialty or subspecialty adapted periodically of all relevant randomized controlled trials. The Cochrane database of systematic reviews embodies Archie Cochrane's vision. The Cochrane collaboration has been a mostly volunteer effort, and it has produced about 2,000 systematic reviews in about a decade of existence. 2,000 reviews may sound comprehensive, but they cover only a fraction of medicine. Many people wonder how sustainable the Cochrane collaboration and its database and other products will be over time. A Cochrane review is a systematic review, so it includes a statement of the clinical problem or question and sources of evidence, which are typically gathered from a literature search. A small number of Cochrane reviews also include non-experimental data, although that practice is somewhat controversial. The inclusion and exclusion criteria for evidence are stated, and the results are presented in both tabulated and graphical form in a variety of ways. Next are the conclusions that come from the review. If there's a meta-analysis, the results of the meta-analysis are described. Cochrane reviews are maintained in an online collection of databases and include the date of the last substantive update or significant new evidence that was added to the review. The Cochrane reviews are meant to be dynamic, living documents, not just reviews that get published in a journal and may be updated a few years later. The goal is for the Cochrane reviews to be continuously updated. There are many sources of syntheses and synopses. The Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews and PubMed Health from the National Library of Medicine are both excellent resources for syntheses. Synopses are also offered by publications such as Clinical Evidence, which bills itself as an evidence formulary and draws on Cochrane reviews and other syntheses and individual studies to summarize evidence. Another important resource for synopses is InfoPoems. Poems stands for Patient-Oriented Evidence That Matters. Finally, there's the Peer Resource, the Physician's Information and Education Resource from the American College of Physicians. Of course, there are some limitations to systematic reviews and summaries of evidence. Some people believe that the use of meta-analysis is misguided. Alvin Feinstein is a well-known epidemiologist who has written in many places about his concern with meta-analysis. He has called it statistical alchemy. We do sometimes see meta-analyses performed on the same topic, using many of the same studies, but reaching different conclusions for a variety of methodologic reasons. One study looked at the so-called half-life of knowledge, or how quickly knowledge became overturned. The domain of liver disease and meta-analysis actually had the shortest half-life, so when something was found to be the truth by meta-analysis, that truth lasted a shorter period of time than something discovered in a randomized controlled trial. Of course, publication bias may be exacerbated in systematic reviews because systematic reviews, in essence, are a sampling of studies, and they represent the spectrum of research done on a given topic. If there's a publication bias, then the systematic reviews are going to be more compromised because they rely on information being appropriately published. When there's publication bias, it may lead us to draw incorrect conclusions from systematic reviews. This concludes Lecture F of Evidence-Based Practice. In summary, for many tests and treatments, there are multiple studies such that one study does not give the complete picture. This has provided incentive for the production of systematic reviews or evidence reports to bring together all the evidence on a treatment or test. According to the Haynes 4S model, Syntheses bring primary data together, and synopses make it available to users in highly summarized form.